Okay, uh, so let me start by clarifying a couple terms just in case there might be uh, confusion. Uh, one of the terms is obviously graduate education. Uh, it creates confusion because what's graduate education in the United States is undergraduate education in Brazil and graduate education in the United States is postgraduate. I mean, graduate education, I'm all confused now. Graduate education in the United States is postgraduate education in Brazil. And when we say graduate education in Brazil, we're talking about undergraduate education in the United States. And this creates a lot of confusion. I do reviews of a lot of abstracts for journals in Brazil. And there's constant confusion between the use of graduate level and the use of postgraduate level and the use of undergraduate level when you're dealing in the two languages. A second uh, issue that I'd like to make clear is that when I'm talking about graduate study and graduate education, I'm talking specifically about programs that offer master and doctoral uh, degrees. Obviously, there are a lot of forms of study that takes place after your undergraduate study that could be classified as graduate in nature. But I'm talking specifically about graduate programs, and I'm talking specifically about the offering of master's degree and or doctoral degrees. Also, I'll be using a lot the word basic education. And when I say basic education, many times in other countries, basic education refers to the very lowest levels of education, but not in Brazil. Brazil, basic education is everything below uh, higher education. It goes really from pre-nursery up to and through the 12th grade. And so uh, remember, when I use basic education, I'm not referring just to the initial grades. I'm talking about everything below the higher education level. OK, uh, let's move on. I really appreciate Elsie for uh, helping me with the slides. It's one aspect of the uh, video conferencing that I really don't dominate yet is how to put your slides in and how to manipulate them. So she's helping me. Uh, so when we're talking about, we're talking about policy. We're talking about policy related to graduate education. And we're talking about national policy, uh, policy that generates from the Ministry of Education and related uh, entities. And when we talk about graduate education policy on the national level, we're talking about four basic components. The first component is the notion of the national system of graduate education. Uh, it's the only unitary system of education in Brazil. You have many systems of uh, basic education state systems, municipal systems. You have two systems of higher education in Brazil. You have what's called the federal system, the state system. And interestingly enough, the federal system includes all private institutions, which means private institutions are accredited and evaluated systematically by the federal government in Brazil. Uh, but there's a unitary system for graduate education. And all programs, whether they be from uh, private institutions or public institutions, are part of this national system of graduate education. Now, this national system is oriented by a plan, a national plan. And the national plan originally was a five-year plan. Now it's a 10-year plan. You can see from the dates here that the plan is currently ending in 2020. A new plan will be put into effect uh, in 2021. But the plans kind of have had different orientations over time, representing the context of the plan. The first plan was in 1974, and it emphasized expansion of graduate education. The second one emphasized the quality of graduate education. The third one emphasized the relationship between graduate education in Brazil and research and research output, which is a very important relationship because today the great majority of publications, the great majority of the research that is done in Brazil is linked to the graduate level. Uh, in addition to the to, to the plan, you have a national board of education. And the national board is responsible, among other things, for accrediting all graduate programs, all programs to be legitimate, to join the national system, to have a diploma that is recognized as legitimate in all parts of the country. You have to have your program accredited. Uh, the national board accredits composed of 24 people. 12 are part of the higher education grouping. 12 are part of the basic education grouping. Uh, and how does the national board make its decision in terms of accrediting or not accrediting? Well, they use a national evaluation result that is developed by COPIES, or the Agency for the Improvement of Higher Education Personnel. COPIES exists in Brazil since 1951. It originally focused on providing scholarships, mainly to study abroad, because there are very few opportunities to do any graduate study in Brazil. Uh, but over time, as the graduate study became more and more part of the educational scene in Brazil, you have copy shifting its focus to Brazilian programs. And in shifting the focus, it does two things. It provides financing 
financing in terms of scholarships, financing in terms of funding that goes directly to the programs, other forms of financing as well. But in addition to the financing, it's responsible for evaluating the quality of graduate programs. And we'll come back to the question of evalu evaluation later on, because one of the things we'll be talking about are changes in the evaluation system that are taking place or will take place in the near future. I should just go back a minute to my title. I'm dealing here with three different uh, what I call innovations, important changes. One is an innovation with respect to the creation of a professional doctorate. This is something new in Brazil. The second innovation has to do with graduate education at a distance. In other words, distance education on the graduate level, which is also something very new in Brazil. And finally, we're dealing with the evaluation system that we'll talk more about and the changes in the evaluation system because the evaluation system started in 1980. And in 40 years, it's changed very, very little. But there are a lot of pressures to make changes. And so we'll talk about that. So go ahead, please, uh, to the next uh, slide. Thank you very much, Elsie. Uh, I won't go into great deal here, great, great detail here, because I can talk for hours about the history of copies and the history of graduate education. But it's just to emphasize that before 1965, you didn't have graduate programs per se. You had graduate education in the sense of uh, relationships between advisors and advisees. In other words, a tutorial type of relationship that existed in kind of an informal manner in which basically the student would prepare a thesis and defend his thesis and he or she would have an advisor, but it wasn't part of a structured program. Uh, this existed until 1965, but starting in 65, things began to change. In 1965, uh, the Ministry of Education formally uh, regulated, structured, defined, organized uh, graduate education. So the programs of graduate education really are subsequent to 1965. And indeed, in the first couple of years or three years, nothing really happened. In fact, in the field of education, uh, as of uh, 1970, there are only two education programs and they both offered doc a master's degree. They did not offer doctor degrees. One was in Rio and the other was in Sao Paulo, the big urban centers in Brazil. So the idea of a graduate program started slowly, but it really took off after 1968 because in 1968, a series of laws were passed. And among these laws, laws to reform higher education, much of the reform was based on the United States model because the United States was working very closely with the military government at that time. And you have to remember, this is the period of the so-called military dictatorship. But uh, in 1968, this reform process kind of remodels the university on the US model. And I should also say that this uh, law or this uh, dictate of 1965 defining graduate education also was based on the United States model. In other words, programs, master's degree, doctoral degrees, and as of 1968, you're changing the university really to be research institutions, to have study by credits, uh, to have a hierarchy for their professors. And among these other changes was the idea of requiring graduate degrees for those people that wanted to be university professors, or at least federal university professors. But at that time, most all universities, with a few exceptions, were federal universities. So the fact that you needed a graduate degree all of a sudden meant there was a tremendous pressure from inside the universities by those people that were already employed to create programs for, they, for them to study and get their necessary uh, credential. Uh, and of course, this is kind of interesting because I did a study recently that resulted in a, in a book about the initial years of graduate education in Brazil. And it was amazing how informal things were at the outset because almost all the students were also professors, many times very important professors at that university. So you had students who were giving classes to other students, you had students that were participating on the uh, uh, thesis committees of other students. In other words, <laughs> there was a really not much of a, a very clear distinction in those days between what, who was a student and who was a professor. But over time, obviously, this has changed. And uh, by 1974, you have the national plan. By 1980, you have the copies evaluation system, which we are going to be talking about. By 1995, the system begins to diversify because when it started, there were two kind of interesting characteristics. The first characteristic was because since it was geared toward preparing university professors or higher education professors, many of whom were already working as professors, preparing them with their necessary uh, degree, uh, the programs were all academic in nature in nature, highly academic, highly theoretical orientation. And this tendency 
continues today, but started in 1995, the system begins to diversify as the students become to uh, begin to diversify as the labor market begins, begins to uh, diversify as there's a need for people with advanced degrees outside of the academic community. And so in 1995, you have the notion of a professional master's degree created, which uh, is comparable, but more applied than the uh, academic master's degree. And we'll come back to that because we'll, we're going to be talking in a while about the uh, doctoral professional degree. Uh, and another, dis, uh, another aspect that uh, changed uh, in the early 2000s was the notion of an interdisciplinary graduate program. These didn't exist, they're all disciplinary up to that time. But with the interdisciplinary program, you have uh, new formats that, on the one hand, you could argue this is a great uh, introduction something important because it's really kind of representing the interdisciplinary nature of the scientific community, which is very positive because it's more and more interdisciplinary. But on the other hand, many of these interdisciplinary programs were being created because, the, because there was not the wherewithal uh, available for the creation of dis disciplinary programs. In other words, to create a program, you needed to get people together from, dis from different disciplines in order to have enough professors for a program. But it meant that the professors who were really disciplinary professors work in what was called an interdisciplinary program. Now, these last four in red are what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about the professional doctoral uh, program. We're going to be talking about changes in the evaluation model. And we're going to be talking about uh, distance education on the graduate level. Okay, please go on to the next slide. Kelsey, oh, thank you. Uh, now, we're talking about change. Now, I'm kind of using in kind of a comparable fashion the word innovation and change, and I understand that technically there's a, there's a difference. Uh, innovation is change that really has a significant impact. And so I'm calling my changes that we're uh, talking about really innovations because they are innovations that have a significant impact on the graduate model in Brazil. And there's several reasons behind this tendency to change, this tendency to innovate that has really come to fore in recent years. One of the reasons is the system is much, much bigger than it used to be. It's growing very rapidly. When I got to Brazil in 1977, we had 300 uh, graduate programs in the country. Now we have 5,000 or almost 5,000 graduate programs in the country. When I got to Brazil, the number of graduate doctoral degrees were very, very few. And now, of course, there are over 2,500 doctoral degree programs in Brazil. I should also say, when I was talking about, I was mentioning they started off as academic. Another uh, interesting characteristic that makes Brazil a little bit different than many other countries is the graduate level really developed with the master's degree and the doctoral degree subsequently. In other words, in many parts of the world, the doctoral degrees came first and the master's degree was inserted later on, especially in the case of Europe, but also in the case of the United States. But in the case of Brazil, original programs were master's programs in which they, but when they could uh, prove that, that they were ad adequately consolidated as a program, uh, they then would uh, prevent, uh, present a proposal for uh, creating a doctoral program. And the doctoral program had to be submitted to copies, evaluated and approved in order uh, to open. But as I said, there are now over 2,500 doctoral programs. You've got the diversification of student demand. Obviously, you have a huge number of students now getting through the undergraduate level that you didn't have in the past. You have more than 8 million undergraduate students in Brazil. And as the numbers get bigger and bigger and more and more people are getting through high school and getting through the university or the college, you've got a greater diversity in terms of the type of students, the background of students, and the demands of students, expectations of students. And these demands of students are related to changing demands in the labor market, which is Brazil has developed. As I said, at one time, there wasn't much of a demand for advanced degrees outside of the academic community. But as time goes on, this demand for academic titles, academic credentials outside of the academic community has increased significantly. And finally, Brazil has a characteristic of very uh, significant disparities in uh, between regions and in terms of wealth, for example, and within regions, especially within urban and rural uh, contexts of regions. And the graduate offer, offerings kind of follow this uh, tendency of great inequality. In other words, the opportunities for graduate study vary greatly depending on where you're living in Brazil. And this, of course, is seen as a problem. And some of the changes that we're going to be talking about are changes that are related to this problem of trying to reduce the inequalities in graduate offerings. Okay. We can go on to the next one. Thank you very much. Uh, so 
I've got a clock here in front of me. I always take more time than I should, but I, so far I'm on schedule. <laughs> I hope I can remain on schedule. Uh, now we're going to be talking about the professional doctrine. This is my first innovation of the three that we're going to be talking about. Uh, as I said, in 1995, you open the possibility for the master degree, professional degree. Uh, but this developed very slowly. From the outset, the professional degree was considered to be inferior to the master's uh, equivalent. Uh, this inferiority was kind of aggravated by the fact that it was indicated from the outset that you could have professors that didn't have doctoral degrees in the professional programs, but they needed doctor, doctor degrees in academic programs. You also had another problem. Copies is focused on the improvement of higher education personnel. And since these professional programs were supposed to be training people for work outside of the higher education community, copies didn't have a justification or perhaps did not want a justification to finance these programs. So these programs do not have the scholarships and they do not have the funding that the academic programs have. Well, based on this difference, this idea of an inferior program and an inferior and a program that did not have funding meant that the, uh, the concept of professional luck uh, developed slowly. But it began taking off as demands increased, as the variety of demands got greater and greater, as the graduate programs were not adequately serving uh, many of the people that wanted to go into the wider uh, labor uh, community. And so you have um, this uh, growth and quite significant growth in recent years, just to give you an idea. Education did not want a professional uh, master's degree. The person who was responsible for implementing the idea, the person within copies, the policymaker in 1995, he told me at that time that he was suggesting the idea of professional master's degrees specifically to serve education. He thought the professional master's degree would be kind of like the ED, the, 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 uh, the MED, no, the, the, the master's of education in the United States, whereby people would be prepared to do uh, work that is re, uh, that, that, that relates to the education community on the lower levels, the basic level, teaching, administration, special skills that are needed. And so he thought that this would be serving education. But education was one of the last areas to accept the idea of the professional masters. It was not, uh, we did not have a professional master's program in education until 2010. In other words, 15 years after uh, this, uh, this possibly was made available. And in fact, because of the fact that we did not want a professional master's degree, a group of programs separated from education they call them, they call their area the teaching area as opposed to the education area. But one of the reasons for the separation, which took place in 2001, was because this group of people thought we should be offering professional uh, master's degree for educators. And so you had for a long time master's degree of a professional nature in teaching, but not master's degree of a professional nature in education. Well, finally, and I was the coordinator, I had this job that I have now as coordinator for the area of education between two, uh, 2005 and 2008. And I spent a lot of time talking about the importance of the masters, uh, the professional masters in education, talking about the need to open up opportunities for people that wanted to devote their careers, careers to, educate, to basic education. Because the way things were set up, what was being looked for in the academic programs were students that wanted to devote themselves to academic pursuits in the sense of research, publication, higher education, teaching. And when you were somebody that wanted to devote your career to basic education, you had very little chance of even get into the program. So to me, you needed programs, specific programs to absorb the demand for people working in basic education. And obviously they needed to be more applied in their nature than were the academic programs, which were highly theoretical. So I argued consistently for this uh, option in the area of education. And I made some progress because our first program was uh, authorized the year after I left my position. And in part, I think I helped uh, provide the groundwork for that. But now there are 50 such programs. The first one was in 2010, but now in 2020, there are 50 such programs in the area of education. And there are like 500 such programs uh, in all areas in Brazil. Uh, but as time goes on, there's obviously pressure to create a, do a professional doctrine. And I would get many invitations in the past to talk about the professional doctorate because we have the EDD in the United States was professional doctorate. And we make a distinction in the United States between the PhD in education and the EDD. And obviously the PhD is supposedly more theoretical and the EDD is more applied. And I would talk about this and talk about the importance of thinking about doctoral degrees of professional nature in order to 
uh, prepare people of high uh, levels of expertise and of knowledge to work outside of the university community. Uh, and so in 2017, uh, all of a sudden, the idea of a professional doctorate was supported by the uh, National Board of Education and copies was authorized to open professional doctorates. Well, there's a story behind that. Because as I said, even though I was talking about it, I wasn't making any progress because the, 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 the position against the professional doctorate was very strong. The argument was that the doctorate was by nature academic. It had to be academic. Wherever you are, you need theory, you need researchability, you need to do research type analysis and so on and so forth. And so uh, the academic community was quite strongly against, in general, the idea of the professional doctorate. I received support from the area of administration and a few other applied areas, but in general, the academic community was against it. So it didn't really come out of the academic community. It came out of the Board of Education. And it came out of the Board of Education. Why? Well, because in 2016, we had a change in government. The government went from a progressive government to a conservative government. And with the conservative government, you had the appointment of people to the Board of Education of a conservative nature. What does conservative nature mean? Well, it means people, in large part, that represent private institutions. And in Brazil, you have huge private institutions that have a lot of power. And so all of a sudden, these private institutions uh, are having a commanding position on the Board of Education. And they see the professional doctorate as something relevant for them because many of the private institutions are dealing with people that are interested in the labor market. Are, they are already in the labor market. Many times they're more, uh, they're older, uh, they're looking for applied learning. And so they advocated this idea of a professional doctorate. And so based on their decision, because they were now a majority within the Board of Education, copies was required to open up this, op the, 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 uh, this option. It did so with a call that was put out in 2018. And the first programs went into operation in 2019. But, but even though I'd been advocating the professional doctorate, and before that I advocated very strongly the professional master's degree, I realized that I perhaps made a mistake because as we received proposals to create professional doctorates, most all of these proposals were based on professional master's degrees. Most of these proposals were very poor because you, not, you could not differentiate in the proposal between the master's degree or the doctorate degree, or you could not differentiate in the proposal between an academic doctorate and a professional doctorate. In other words, there was no conception of what a professional doctorate meant. There was no uh, conception of what the profession meant that the doctor was, ever, was supposed to be preparing people for. And so in the field of education, we rejected the great majority of these proposals. In fact, today we only have three programs that have been approved and two of those aren't in operation still. Only one is actually in operation. So this is getting off the board rather slowly because the quality of the proposals that are being presented are very poor. But more than that, I'm perceiving that what's going to happen is that creating the doctorate on the professional level, within professional programs, it's going to distort the idea of the professional masters that I was defending. Because I was defending a professional master that was, term, uh, that was terminal in nature, that were preparing people at the master's level to move into primarily basic education, use their skills either within the classroom or within the administrative uh, structure. But I really didn't want people going on in their studies because once they go on, then all of a sudden their uh, expectations change. Higher education pays much more than basic education does. Once you have a doctorate, independently of whether or not it's academic or professional, uh, the higher education opportunities are open. In other words, I'm afraid of distorting the master's program that I'd advocated before as programs open up doctorates. Obviously, doctorates represent more prestige, not only for the student, but for the professor that works on the doctoral level rather than just the master's level. And so over time, I'm, I'm concerned. I'm concerned that the idea of the master's of professional degree that is terminal in nature, and that gets people within a couple of years out uh, working in basic education, I'm afraid that idea just might be undermined by the very thing I was advocating, which was the professional doctrine. As of now, we really can't say what's going on because I only have one program in the field of education that's functioning. Overall, there are 47 such programs that have been approved across all areas, but it's still kind of an experimental uh, process. We really haven't had a chance to evaluate the impact of the professional doctorate and what it means vis-a-vis -vis the academic doctorate. Okay, almost, let's go to the next one. Okay, no, uh, go back. Uh, thank you. We're now talking about our second 
innovation. The second one, innovation is distance education at the graduate level. Now, interestingly enough, in the United States, according to the statistics that I re uh, recently looked up, 11% of undergraduate students in the United States study at the distance, in distance uh, formats. 22% of the graduate students in the United States study in distance formats. In Brazil, it's exactly the opposite to an extreme extent because there are no graduate programs in that, that are uh, distance education programs that are in existence in Brazil. They don't exist yet. And on the other hand, you've got 26% of the undergraduates studying in distance programs and you've got a problem, a very clear problem with distance education in Brazil because over time the quality has gotten lower and lower. The distance between results for the traditional programs and results for the distance programs, this is on the undergraduate level, the distance between these results has become greater and greater. Uh, the supervision, the uh, evaluation that at one time existed for distance education in Brazil has virtually disappeared. At one time we had a secretariat for distance education, but this has disappeared. And part of this has to do with the great power of these uh, big multi, often multinational groups that are offering distance education. They're mainly for-profit institutions and there's nothing better for a for-profit institution than distance education because you get a lot of students and they're paying obviously private institutions and you have to pay a relatively few prof professors to deal with this huge number of students. So Brazil, as I said, has 26% now of its undergraduate students studying in distance programs. These distance programs are suffering from problems of quality, and I think this is widely recognized. Uh, and um, uh, the, the question is, is oh, I, one other uh, piece of data too, 70% of these distance education offerings on the undergraduate level, 70% are offered by five institutions. And as I said, there are mega institutions, several, several of them like DeVry, Laureate, et cetera, are international with a basis in the United States. Laureate had Bill Clinton, as you might remember, as the uh, honorary president of Laureate. Uh, these are huge institutions that are able to offer uh, mass education via distance education. And obviously as huge institutions, they have a lot of internal power. So, so Bob, it's based on the internal I, power that they, as I said, become powerful within the state board, the National Board of Education. And now they have authorized the creation of distance education programs on the graduate level. Can I, well, can I interrupt you for a moment, Bob? Excuse me? Can I interrupt you for a moment? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, so, so just, I mean, I don't want to interrupt the policy discussion, but in the US, higher education is moving radically to distance education, obviously. We're not, we're not ready for it, but we're doing it anyway. What's, what's the current situation in Brazilian universities? Are, are, are they all going distance education or are they simply postponing the academic year or what's, what's, their, what's their plan for uh, dealing with the- Well, as, as I said, 70% uh, of the, the offerings are offered by five institutions. Uh, 90 some percent are offered by private institutions. The great majority of those private institutions are for-profit institutions. Overall, almost 50% of all uh, undergraduate students study in a for-profit institution. You know, the for-profit sector is huge in Brazil. And so, so far, it's been really a private sector and especially a for-profit sector phenomenon. The f universities, especially the federal universities and also to a certain extent, the state universities have tended to reject distance education. So they've worked at it in a very limited uh, sense. They're but, offering but distance Bob, education. Bob, what's happening? Not in a massifying sense. What's happening? During COVID, I think that's what David is asking. Yeah, what's what's the current situation? Because you can't have fifty students in a lecture hall, you know, listening to a professor, with the pandemic on. So, what are, what are the public universities oh, doing? Okay. Well, Does we make a distinction between remote education and distance education. When we're talking about distance education, we're talking about programs that are organized and geared around distance education, and in terms of the graduate level, they're gonna to have to be formally approved before they can even open. Remote education is when you're dealing with traditional programs, but you're offering uh, the programs via a remote network, uh, video conferencing, for example. So obviously during the, the, the pandemic, many universities are still closed. Uh, many universities are not giving class yet. Uh, my university is closed. Many other universities are closed, especially federal university. Some are opening, some are giving classes, especially these remote, what we call remote type classes via video conferencing and so on and so forth. So yes, and there's probably been a new mentality being created in terms of 
actually utilizing the new technologies. I think all of us now are more familiar with them. We're probably less scared of them as we were before, but more open to utilizing them. So this may have an impact. I think in the future, we're going to be doing a lot more things remotely than in a traditional sense. Uh, I see this happening uh, in terms of all kinds of meetings that were once everyone had to go to the meetings, you had to catch an airplane and so on and so forth. And now you can do a lot of things uh, remotely. But we do make a difference, a distinction between the remote education that takes place in traditional programs and distance education where the whole program is organized around distance education. Uh, even though by Brazilian legislation, uh, the distance education, no matter whether it's graduate or undergraduate, it has to have a component in which the student actually goes to the institution and spends time in the institution that's offering the, uh, the uh, program. Uh, so there is a certain, there is a certain mix between the uh, traditional and the distance, but it's a mix that's heavily in favor of the distance as opposed to the traditional present type learning. Uh, did I answer your question, David? Yeah. Yes. Well, I think, uh, but I think things, you, but you're absolutely right. Uh, there is going to be a greater, I think, uh, uh, opening for pro uh, probably distance programs, maybe as a part of this experience, as we learn how to use the mechanisms that we associate with distance education. But let me go back to what's going on on the graduate level. Because the graduate level, first of all, there is huge resistance, and most of us, and I'm one of those people, we are concerned about the idea of a higher education or a graduate level academic community. In other words, we see graduate level education really as a community experience, an academic community experience. You learn as much from your fellow students as you do from your professors, and you're uh, living in an ambiance in which you've got research taking place, and articles being written. In other words, you're learning what you're supposed to be learning at the graduate level by being in association directly with other people uh, and with professors, your advisor, for example. One thing you'll never do on, in, on the graduate level is massify uh, education through distance education on the graduate level. You'll never do it because the graduate level is based on a relationship between an advisor and an advisee. You're never going to massify advisors because advisors have to have the typical qualifi qualifications of a doctorate and so on and so forth. And so this means that you're, you, you'll never do what you did on the undergraduate level in terms of broadly massifying opportunities. But obviously you can take opportunities to places that have been uh, excluded to places where people haven't had a chance to study on the graduate level. And so there's a positive side to it too. But we're concerned both because there's a lack of this community that we consider essential for graduate study. And there is this unfortunate experience on the undergraduate level where basically it's been, it's grown, growing very fast, but it's not growing within the more traditional universities. It's growing basically in institutions that are largely set up to offer distance education. And as I said, they tend to use it uh, for profit making because it's very effective for profit making. So what's happened to finish my distance education issue? Distance education then goes to copies. Copies creates legislation defining what distance education is, defining the conditions that are necessary to permit a proposal. It has a call for proposals. Uh, before the call, I head up a, uh, a, a committee, a work group, that was responsible for, for operationally, operationalizing the evaluation of the proposals. In other words, since the copies people don't have experience with distance education, there's been no distance education at the graduate level, how do you evaluate a proposal using the traditional people that evaluate proposals who are professors uh, that have no experience in distance education? Uh, in the context of copies. So we created a whole systematic for evaluating distance education proposals. We created 56 indicators. We created a series of criteria that people can utilize when they're evaluating a proposal in order to guarantee that the first proposals are high quality. Because we don't want to start out with a low quality situation. We want to start out with the best possible quality. So there's a call. We've got the orientations for the uh, evaluation of these proposals set up. And these are uh, divulged within the uh, wider community. We get 17 proposals and two of those are eliminated right off because they didn't meet the initial criteria to even present a proposal. 15 are evaluated and I was the responsible for the, the commission that did the evaluation and we ended up rejecting all 15 of them. So none of these that permit uh, that, that that have submitted proposals, and this was the end of last year the proposals were submitted, but none of these have been approved so far. They still have a chance to uh, have recourse. They can ask for reconsideration. We don't know how that's going to work out. But according to our committee, at least, uh, 
the quality was not good at all. Either what happened is you, uh, an institution took its undergraduate experience and tried to pass it on to the graduate level, not giving consideration, for example, to the uh, advisor advisee relationship, which is fundamental for the graduate level, or they took their traditional program and they made their traditional program available at a distance on a distance basis. In other words, they would uh, tape professors giving their regular classes, or they would have video conferences, their regular classes. In other words, it was just the, pre the, the traditional program uh, being offered to people that weren't local in nature. Well, this was not what we're thinking of, because we think that a, uh, a program in distance education has to have sp uh, special attributes to take advantage of the technology and the opportunities that uh, distance platforms provide. And so if you don't really have a knowledge or a utilization of the sophisticated distance programs that are available, and you're just taping your professors and distributing the tapes, you're not really offering the type of distance education program that we are imagining that should happen. So we'll see what happens. Because as I said, they've been, they've, none has been accepted. There's no distance education uh, graduate program in Brazil yet. We'll see how the uh, the, the, the request for reconsideration, how they go, uh, but probably programs will have to wait or institutions will have to wait until the next call. And uh, hopefully they'll take advantage of the, uh, re, uh, the, the feedback that the evaluation committee provides, uh, telling them what the deficiencies are and suggesting that they utilize more carefully the documentation that we made available as to what is a good program in distance education. Because we sense that although our work group produced this documentation and made it public, most of those that presented proposals really hadn't read uh, our document and they really didn't take advantage of the criteria or the indicators that we were telling them that we would be utilizing for the evaluation process. Okay, Bob, let's go on. Can, can I interrupt sure. for a second? Um, I, you know, there, I, for some years I sat on the scientific board of a virtual university in Spain, uh, in, in Barcelona. Um, it's called the uh, WOC, U-O-C. Um, it's very successful, particularly at the graduate level. And I'll tell you why. The undergraduate courses are long, particularly now with the Bologna. It used to be that Spain had a three and two. So three years and two years undergraduate. Uh, but uh, now it's four years. So very few people who, who actually start a degree can, uh, can, will finish, uh, I think 11% or 15%. It's something like uh, Phoenix. But the graduate uh, one-year master's degree, 55% uh, finish this in two years uh, uh, at uh, distance. It's, it's not much, it's just a little bit cheaper than a face-to-face -face university. Um, you have to do a curriculum. It's very expensive. You have to develop the curriculum, as you said, use the platforms. But I suggest if you're, if you have a board that's looking at this stuff and evaluating it, you should see what the, we've evaluated that program. Um, and it does produce income gains for the people that, that do it. It has pretty good value for the people that do it. And it's relatively cheap for them because they don't give up income foregone, et cetera, as you know the whole story. So I would look, I would look, there are um, examples out there of, of programs that work. And if they really want to go ahead with this, in some ways, it makes much more sense to have distant graduate level education, particularly master's degrees, uh, than it does to have undergraduate in terms of people being able to finish them in a reasonable amount of time. And they're quite specific. So again, distance education can teach people specific skills much more efficiently than general skills. Uh, uh, I think it's, it's worth looking at that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and well, actually our, our, our group that produced these criteria and these indicators, we tried to review the international literature. And, and you're right, there are a lot of positive examples. Uh, uh, a member of our group today, Sean Smallman, uh, gave me very positive results from the uh, from Portland State University with regard to distance education. Uh, so I recognize that, uh, and, and as I pointed out before, 22% of the students This in university the might actually have a program level. in Brazil. Uh, 
uh, they generally just have it in Spanish speaking Latin America, but a lot of their graduate students doing this master's degrees in Spain at distance, they have a lot of Latin Americans. I think it's, all, it's not in Brazil, but it's in, it's in Spanish speaking Latin America. Anyway. I, I, yeah, just, I think our, 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 major, our major concern, Martin, is getting off on the right foot. You know, we want to yeah, make yeah. sure that our original proposals are well structured and well organized and they take full advantage of what distance education can offer. And we didn't see that in these proposals initially, I but bet, I think we can I bet you provide a lot of orientation. We can socialize better the various aspects that we're looking for with regard to a graduate program in distance education. I agree, it's something- the problem, the problem with good distance education is that it's expensive. <laughs> That's the problem. Uh, people think it's cheap, but it's not cheap. It's actually, it's just a little bit cheaper. It's cheaper to the individual because they don't have income foregone. Right. Uh, they have to give up leisure, but they don't, and have to have discipline. But at a at graduate level, they've already done university degrees, and mm -hmm. they're older, so that they are likely to be more disciplined in doing this and motivated in many ways. Mm -hmm. And it, especially if they have jobs, they probably these graduate degrees serve their jobs, so that they will get. Um, they might even get promoted on the basis of this degree, etc. So uh, I, I think there are a lot of advantages to it uh, for working people, but unfortunately the universities think that they can save a lot of money by doing this and it, it just doesn't work that way. Yeah. No, actually you're, you're right, Martin. In fact, these, these mega institutions that are for profit don't really have the profit motive with regard to the, uh, the graduate level because of the fact that you have to have this relationship between advisor and advisee and right. you can't have a huge number of advisees, you just can't, you know, right. uh, get the uh, work done with a lot of different people that you're advising. So it'll never be uh, that that popular, even with these types of institutes. So maybe it'll be something that exists more uh, in a stronger sense, maybe in public institutions, you know, perhaps the public institutions will see this value and invest in distance education, even though, as you said, it requires a lot of money, especially to start off with. And often the public institutions don't have a lot of money at the moment. So uh, I think it's something that's definitely going to be a reality of the future. But I guess my question, but I want to get on to my next component, but I can't resist, resist asking you this, Martin. If somebody applies for a job at Stanford and has a PhD from a distance program vis-a-vis -vis a traditional university, would the person have equal consideration or would it be a mark against him the fact that he got his doctorate from a distance program? No, they would. If you have an Arizona State distance education degree, uh, it probably is not <laughs> going to get you the job. But uh, on the other hand, the people that take these, most people that take these distance education degrees already have jobs. 95% yeah. of the people in Spain that are doing this already have jobs. And so it's like, it's like uh, what is the, uh, the big training program in Brazil uh, that's so successful. Uh, those people already have jobs. Mm -hmm. And so they're sent to be right. trained. Uh, and this is the same thing with this university. So what right. the people do is they basically, many of the people are taking these degrees because they need them to get promoted uh, mm -hmm. or whatever. Or, uh, or they're in a job that requires a master's degree. So they've got to get it or <laughs> it's not legit. So the point is that it has immediate return. Uh, it isn't, it, it doesn't, it isn't a job getting degree. It's a job enhancement degree. Uh, and, there, and there's a room for that. I, I'm not against it. Uh, I think it just has to, it can't cheat the people. It can't, it can't cheat them by giving them terrible, terrible education. That's, that's the problem. It, it's, it, it, it has a place in the education system, but if it's run by profit-making institutions, purely profit-making institutions, uh, who wanna just rip off the people like Trump University or something like that, then it, it's a scam. And that's, that's what you have to avoid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think those are good insights. I find that 
when I see these people on television that are so-called experts are always presented as a doctor so-and-so who's talking about some intellectual type thing, but it's not connected with the university. I look them up and <laughs> the person invariably has a uh, distance education doctorate. As you said, there are people already on the market and there are people that are looking for a higher title and uh, greater opportunities. But I think uh, you're right. I think we'll see more distance education in the future. And uh, I'm just concerned about getting off to the right start. Uh, so let's go on because I, I, I have about until, I understand that I have until 10 o'clock. Is that right, David? Uh, you have a few minutes more than that. I mean, we'll, okay, we'll, end at 10, we'll end at 1020 or, or so. So you, you can go a little over as long as you don't mind being interrupted along the way. <laughs> no, when it's Martin, I think it's great because I always learn from Martin. Uh, and you too, David. Uh, the, um, so I have a clock here right in front of me. I'm watching the clock. I'm already behind schedule, but with this extra five minutes that you gave me, I should be able to get through my, my presentation. So we're now going to the question of evaluation. As I said, evaluation is a key component of the work that Copies does. Uh, Copies has 49 different knowledge areas. Each knowledge area has a coordinator. I'm the coordinator for the field of education. And as obviously, obviously there are 48 other coordinators for these uh, different areas of knowledge. Some areas of knowledge have a lot of programs, such as education. We have about 200 programs. Other areas of knowledge have very few programs. So <laughs> the amount of work that the coordinator has to do varies from area to area. But the whole idea is to evaluate. Every four years, there's a national evaluation. And the national evaluation results in a grade for every single program in the country. And as I told you, that grade has major implications. It has implications as to getting or not getting uh, approval by the National Board of Education. They're looking for the National Board of Education. They're looking on a seven point scale, one to seven. They're looking for a three. If you don't get a three on the valuation, you are excluded from the system and you have no legitimacy. But anything above three, you're permitted to be part of the system. But why would you want more than three? Well, you want more than three because financing is based on your grade and it goes up to seven. And so obviously if you get a better grade, the financing will be better. And so there's motivation strong motivation to seek the highest possible grade. This obviously has good points and bad points. One, one good point could be the competition is generating a higher quality and indeed compared to many other countries, especially so-called countries in process of development, uh, Brazil certainly has the best uh, graduate education. It's a much better graduate education than any other country in Latin America. And I think most countries that are not at the very top echelon of uh, development, few of them have a graduate system that rivals Brazil. Indeed, as most things in Brazil, the higher you go up, the better things get. When you're down at the bottom, like basic education, you've got huge problems. When you reach the, the apex graduate education, you're really talking about a very consolidated, a very widely respected system. And part of that is due to the evaluation process. But the evaluation process is something that uh, has a lot of problems. One thing is that it generates this kind of idea that you've got to produce, you've got to produce, you've got to produce. And many times you're leaving behind processes that are important, especially teaching learning processes. Uh, you're forgetting about student learning in order to produce your articles because the articles are what's going into the evaluation because it's much easier in large scale evaluations to look at concrete results such as articles produced than processes such as the process of, teach, uh, of student learning. Uh, and also you, 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 you have a, a system that's a unitary system, the same uh, dimensions and the same sub-dimensions for the valuation are used for all programs independently of their location. And so I have a list here of some of the key characteristics of the of this evaluation process. As I said, it starts in 1980. Now it's large scale, it was small scale. Uh, when I first started evaluating programs in the area of education as part of the committee, there were seven people on the committee. And you can imagine how easy it was to establish a common viewpoint when we were evaluating different programs. We could evaluate them with a kind of a standardized approach. But now, next year, we'll be evaluating again all the programs, the 200 programs, and I'll have 60 people. And to establish a common perspective among 60 people uh, brought together to spend a week in Brasilia, that's a really tough thing to do. So this makes the evaluation more and more dubious as you get bigger and bigger. Another element, as I said, it's a single system, which means that you use the same uh, basic uh, criteria and ba basic uh, approach to all the, uh, all the courses because it's a single system. So it's obvious that all uh, programs should be evaluated according to the same reference point. 
quality is quality and it's got to be the same quality, uh, at least the minimum quality has to be a minimum quality in any place in the system. You've got a good aspect in the sense that it tends to be criterion reference. I say it tends to be because there is a tendency to seek kind of a normal curve, but all uh, areas, all these 49 areas have to produce a document before the evaluation that makes public exactly what indicators are going to be used and gives programs a clear idea of where they're going to end up in the evaluation process. So it's criterion reference, uh, which is rare among large scale evaluation efforts. You have I, I, until now, you've had an exclusively external approach. In other words, it's been evaluated by people that go to Brasilia, that look at reports that are produced every year. Uh, the internal evaluation, which is so emphasized in the United States and emphasized in Europe, the internal evaluation has not been utilized within the copies model. The self-evaluation has not been utilized. And as I said, you get a ranking that goes from one to seven. The, the, the idea of a six and seven is supposed to be you're a very special program. In other words, you're a good program and in place in the world. You meet international standards of a top program. And so there are only about 10 or 12% of all the programs that get this grade of six or seven. Uh, most of the grades are in the three, four category. As you move up to five, the percentage gets lower. And as you move up to six, seven, you're talking about 10 to 12% of all the evaluations. And finally, as I pointed out, it's high stakes. Okay, you can move to the next one, please. Now, these various forces that I mentioned at the outset, uh, the growth, the diversity of students, the diversity of the labor market, uh, these factors are creating pressures to change. Also, the huge discrepancies and opportunity. Because in a sense, since you're linking the, grad, the, the results of the evaluation to financing, it means those programs with the best results get the most money, and those programs with the best results tend to be programs in the best economic and social contexts. Uh, such as the so-called most developed part of the country. And so parts that are more distant, that are uh, less developed, obviously have fewer opportunities. The programs tend to be weaker. They get less money because their program gets a lower grade. And obviously they remain weaker. They don't get stronger over time. So this is a problem. Uh, so with uh, these various forces, uh, all of a sudden copies is concerned about changing the evaluation. It's been highly criticized. And I participated in the uh, work group that was created in 2015 to, re, uh, to, to review the system and provide uh, proposals. But more recently, a commission was uh, attributed, a commission that already existed, uh, which accompanied the plan, the national plan, that 10-year plan that I mentioned. This commission was given the responsibility of making concrete proposals to change the system. And they asked all possible entities in the academic community to make suggestions. They had over 240 different su suggestions. They synthesized this and came out with some key decisions that changed to a certain extent, not to a great extent, but a certain extent, what's been happening, uh, attempting to correct some of the problems that we have uh, been trying to solve. One thing is to emphasize student learning. As I said, over time, more and more of the emphasis turns to uh, output to publications, for example, specifically. It's publications whereby, whereby we get international exposure. We now have these international evaluations of publications. If we can tell you exactly what percent of the publications internationally uh, come from Brazil, it's about 14% today. Uh, and so the pressure to publish and the pressure to get prestige, not only within your uh, institution, but within the whole country of Brazil, this has generated a big effort away from the emphasis on uh, student learning. And so now the idea is to return to student learning and emphasize student learning. I'll get back to that in a minute. To emphasize societal impact. This, uh, this is something that had not been adequately emphasized up, up to now. What does the program mean in terms of society? What kind of impact is it having? Ha is it having? And when we talk about impact, we're talking in part of following up on graduates. Where are they going? What are they doing? Are they taking advantage in some way of what they learned? Has their learning benefited them in the labor market? And so impact is a new emphasis. You have now a greater emphasis on qualitative indicators, which for me creates a great problem because it's difficult to work with quali qualitative indicators when you're dealing with 60 people evaluating at the same time. But it allows you to get deeper. It allows you to contextualize in a qualitative sense. You can contextualize that you can't do with the quantitative indicators. And at one time, the indicators were primarily, primarily quantitative, mainly because of the size of the system, the quantity of data that was being produced. But now, with this new emphasis, the focus is on qualitative indicators. We used to have two thirds of our indicators that were quantitative. Now we have two thirds that are qualitative. Uh, one of the big innovations, it sounds like a small thing, but it's a big thing, 
is to emphasize just the high quality products, not all products. Uh, because the way things were before, it produced what is known as productive, productivism, pro <laughs> a, product, a production mentality, where you just produce as much as you could because you could produce low quality publications and compensate for the fact that you didn't have high quality uh, publications. But obviously, a small number of high quality uh, high quality publications has a much greater impact than a large number of low quality uh, publications. So the idea now is to emphasize just the best uh, publications of any program. And this is good for education. Why? Because we have to produce some low quality publications. It's in our interest, but we don't like to be jeopardized for producing low quality publications. For, why would we want to produce low quality publications? Well, re remember, we, we're using international standards to establish quality. And by those standards, what we publish for the, for the basic education community, for teachers, those things are low quality. And yet we've got to be publishing those things. So why should we be jeopardized for publishing those things? Also, many of the publications that we do with our students aren't of top quality, especially for the students to lead uh, author. But the experience of publishing is so important for the student to learn about the academic community. So it's good to be able to produce low quality and as long as you do produce high quality and not be jeopardized in terms of an average that takes into account your low quality. So another aspect, to, and I know I'm down to just a few minutes, uh, another thing to emphasize is the fact that the program is being emphasized as programming, as opposed to a collection of individual people producing individually. In other words, the program should be a program. And if it's a program, it should have two attributes. It should have a strategic plan and it should have a system for self-evaluation. And so these two aspects and the nature and the idea emphasize program as program, and not just a sum of individual uh, activities. With this emphasis on the program, the question of planning, the question of self-evaluation. As I said, the evaluation has been external, but now with the emphasis on self-evaluation, the evaluation will be more and more internal over time because we're starting off with just the request for a proposal. They don't have to provide any results, but they have to present a proposal for self-evaluation. And the weight isn't very great. In other words, the programs will be learning how to develop self-evaluation uh, projects. Uh, but as they do, I think oh, more and more, just as in the case of the United States and other parts of the world, the internal evaluation will become more important in time than the external evaluation, which is becoming more and more precarious because of the huge number of programs that have to be evaluated. Okay, let me go on to the next, please. Uh, this is what we had to do in order to, uh, in order to operationalize, is to change the evaluation form. As I said, you're, giving, you're given pre-established dimensions. You're given pre-established sub-dimensions, which we call items. And we've changed what the dimensions are. We've changed what the sub-dimensions are uh, in order to emphasize these three aspects, the program, the student learning, and the societal impact. These are the key aspects. Whereas in the past, other things were emphasized, especially the intellectual output, which was a not only a dimension of its own, but also it was usually the dimension that had the most weight. Well, this changes now because intellectual output goes into the dimension of student learning. Well, why is that? Well, because the idea of intellectual output, the idea of doing research is to prepare students to do research. That's why we justify the graduate program in terms of academic output. We justify it because academic output is part of a learning process. So what was a separate dimension with a lot of weight becomes a dimension that has, it's no, it's no longer a dimension, it's inside another dimension that has a number of different sub-dimensions in addition to the dimension of uh, academic output. But academic output now becomes an instrument for student learning and not just an instrument for prestige of the program and for knowledge expansion. It's the learning that's the most important thing. Okay, please once more. Thank you. Okay, so these uh, different attributes that I just mentioned are now implemented and they will be applied in 2021 because evaluation takes place every four years and 2021 will be the next uh, evaluation period and it will be for the period of 2017 through 2020. Uh, and as I said, there's a new evaluation form. 
there's an emphasis on student learning, there's an emphasis on the program that didn't exist before, there's an emphasis on program impact, which involves also the follow-up of uh, former students. All these things are new to the evaluation process. But there are more changes that are expected in the future. In fact, this, the changes that were made during this period right now, this evaluation period, they're expected to provide a basis for a more substantial changes in the next evaluation period. And so the same commission has produced a new document. It was just distributed in May. It's been heavily criticized, evaluated, discussed. I'm participating in a, a meeting this evening and one tomorrow afternoon that will be discussing this document and the various proposals that it has. But the most important, even though I could go through each one of these, the most important of these proposed changes is this last uh, one mentioned, which is the adoption of a multi-dimensional evaluation model. Now, what is a multi-dimensional evaluation model? Well, I've already said that we, divide, we, 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 we have dimensions. We evaluate different dimensions. Like right now, we're evaluating those three dimensions, student learning, program, and societal impact. But everything results in a single grade. And the idea of a multidimensional evaluation is to give separate grades for separate dimensions. And there's not a joining of grades. There's not an output that represents a single grade. And what dimension is emphasized is the dimension that corresponds to the context, to the mission of the program. So what, what's being used here is the, a model that's developed. You can, uh, you can go to one more, please. Uh, next slide, thank you. So what's being emphasized is a model that really was, was developed in uh, the Netherlands in conjunction with Germany. Uh, it's called the U-ranking system. Uh, you uh, multi-ranking system. It was created kind of as an alternative to that traditional ranking that comes out of the Times, that comes out of Shanghai, so on and so forth. These international rankings, Europe doesn't like too much because they don't tend to do that well on those rankings. And so they've created a new ranking system that's this multi-ranking approach where you don't have a single grade. You don't have a single point in a ranking scale, but it depends on different dimensions and what is valued depends on what the institution is set up to do, its context, where it operates, its mission, its objectives, so on and so forth. So there are five dimensions. And really this comes from the model that is being used in uh, the Netherlands and Germany. I was part of a five person committee that went to Germany and, and the Netherlands in 2018 to see this model firsthand. Then the group that produced the model came and visited copies and talked about the model in the copies context. Uh, so they've got five dimensions. You've got the, uh, uh, the learning, student learning, societal impact, innovation and transfer of knowledge. You've got internationalization and you've got research. These are five different dimensions. And as you can see from the presentation here, you can have uh, programs that are big on one dimension and not big on another. Like this one, which is a little lighter here is big in internationalization, but it's not very big in innovation and transfer of knowledge. The other, which is a darker color, is big in international innovation and transfer of knowledge, but it's not big internationalization. And what should we value? Well, it depends what the program is really set out to do. You know, are you focused on innovation? Are you focused on internationalization? Are you focused on societal impact? Are you focusing on uh, research? Are you focusing on the uh, learning of students? Every one of these dimensions has to receive a minimal grade. You can't be zero on any one of these dimensions. But the idea of being higher or lower on any given dimension is related to what the context is and what the mission of the program is. So go on, just, we're just about finished. This is what's produced by the U ranking multi, the U multi rank uh, approach, which as I said, is a European model that comes out of the University of Twente, which is located on the border between Germany and Amsterdam and, 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 and the Netherlands. And they operate, the, 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 this model is utilized in mainly in the Netherlands and in Germany. Uh, and they tend to, tr what they do is they try to present uh, a mapping of the results in a graphic way where you can see where the uh, program, or in this case, it's an institution, where the institution is strong and where the institution is weak. And they use the different colors. And you can see, for instance, that this institution is not doing very well in regional engagement, but it's doing very well in international orientation. And you can get an idea and you can do a comparative analysis too. But the comparative analysis is related also to what the uh, particular institution or particular program is trying to achieve. You can go on very quickly. 
just one more. Finally, this group, when they came to Brazil from Germany and Holland, excuse me, the Netherlands, they, uh, they, they asked for data for a couple of Brazilian universities in order to produce this kind of map for the Brazilian universities. And so they got data for the University of Sao Paulo, the State University of Sao Paulo and the State University of Campinas. But unfortunately, the data was totally incomplete. And so you, this comparison makes no sense whatsoever. From looking at it, you would say that USP is much, much better than Campinas because obviously they have many more um, uh, lines that approach the outer edge of the circle. But this is because of lack of data. But the idea is to show visually what the value, excuse me, what the quality and what the orientation of the program is. And Copies intends to implement this multidimensional uh, process starting this next four year period, which starts in 2021. And the idea is to not have the single grade anymore, but to have five grades. Now, what this means in terms of funding hasn't really been clarified. And so we're kind of fearful that maybe we'll go back to a single grade in order to determine the funding because the funding is related to the evaluation results. But obviously, uh, there are other ways to attribute funding, especially in terms of what the uh, program is doing in terms of what it intends to do. Is it achieving what it intends to achieve and utilizing a relative approach, you could base funding on that. We hope that it'll be done that way and not going back to create a unitary grade for every program. So that finishes my study. If you go to the last slide, it has just an, uh, a thank you and an email address. And anybody would, that would like to communicate with me, I'm pretty good with email. I try to respond right away. Uh, so if you want to write me, if you have any questions or doubts, uh, I'd love to hear from you. And thank you very much for taking part in this webinar.